Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. Story 1. I checked my phone and saw that it was already 2 a.m. Exhausted from finishing my task of cleaning the bathroom upstairs, I headed towards my room. However, a sudden realization struck me. I remembered that my dog had slipped out of my room and gone downstairs while I was occupied with my cleaning duties. At 1 a.m., concerned, I peered down the stairs and called out for him. Silence greeted my ears. Taking a few hesitant steps down, I called his name once again, but received no response. I rationalized that perhaps he simply wanted to sleep downstairs for the night, although it was highly unusual. Since he was a puppy, he had always preferred slumbering in my room. Dismissing it as a passing whim, I attributed his behavior to old age. As I ascended the stairs, however, a jingling noise emanated from below followed by a pained yelp from my dog. It sounded as if someone had accidentally stepped on his tail. Curiosity compelled me to turn around and face the stairs. And as I did, I felt a sudden rush of air brush past me. In an attempt to uncover the source of the commotion, I switched on the flashlight feature on my phone and cautiously descended the stairs, its beam illuminating the path before me. I scanned the area, desperately searching for my dog. Then, another jingling sound echoed through the house, but this time it came from upstairs. I surmised that my dog had darted past me while I was turning around, managing to evade my notice. But as I climbed back up the stairs and peered into my room, the sight that greeted me was unsettling. There was my dog, perched on my bed, wearing an expression that seemed unnervingly human-like. Its eerie smile bore into me, leaving me feeling nauseated overwhelmed by a sudden urge to use the restroom. I hastily closed my bedroom door with my dog still fixedly gazing at me from the bed. I hurried to the restroom, shutting the door behind me and attended to my needs. After washing my hands, after washing my hands, I felt a craving for a snack before bed. As I made my way downstairs, my dog suddenly dashed in front of me as it often did whenever we descended the stairs together. I proceeded towards the kitchen, searching for a late night treat. It was while perusing the contents of the fridge that something caught my attention in my peripheral vision. There was my dog, staring at me once again with that disconcertingly human smile. I called out to him, urging him to come closer, but he remained fixed in his unsettling gaze, that same eerie smile still plastered on his face. Then it hit me. I distinctly remembered closing the bedroom door behind me before entering the bathroom. Or did I... I could have sworn I did. But then, how did my dog manage to open the door? A feeling of unease washed over me, and doubt began to gnaw at my mind. Story 2 Once a year, my parents had me take a bloodbath. It was always on the day before my birthday, a tradition I didn't enjoy, but never questioned. My mother would lead me to the tub, my father sitting on the edge dipping his fingers in to check the temperature for me. I would sit while they washed it into my skin and hair, making sure that I was completely covered before letting me get out. Then I would have to wait as it dried, making my skin feel tight and sticky. I was then sent off to bed with a hug and kiss. On my birthday, the first thing I did was shower off, watching the red retreat down the drain. Then it was like any other birthday, Singing, presents, and cake. It never crossed my mind that our tradition was abnormal. I was excited for my 10th birthday. The prospect of having two digits to my age was exhilarating to me. I'd been homeschooled my whole life, but had plenty of friends in my neighborhood to invite to my party. I was asking my friend, Jimmy, 
if he was going to be able to come when I caught a glimpse behind the veil. Oh man, I have to go visit my cousins on Saturday. But maybe I can play with you the day before, he had asked. I thought about it, but knew that my annual bath was due that day. Disappointed, I explained to him why that wouldn't work. Shucks, that's the day I have to take my bath, I told him. Okay, well maybe after that. No, I'll be all sticky. Plus, all the blood gets on everything. I could tell by his expression that I had said something wrong. He went running his mouth to everyone, calling me a vampire and upsetting both of our parents, albeit for different reasons. That night, I had the first discussion about the blood baths with my father. He sat me on the couch and got real serious. Now, Ben, today will be the last time you ever talk about the baths you have to take, he stated sternly. He went on to explain that not everything we did was considered normal, and that by keeping it to myself, I was doing us all a favor. After that discussion, I became more curious. It was intriguing to me that not everybody had to take these baths. As I aged into a teen, I started doing what all boys do. I rebelled and hard. Since I didn't go to school, I tried even harder to fit in when I was around my friends. I smoked. I vandalized. I stole alcohol from my parents. Some of it could be attributed to peer pressure, but a lot of it was my own choices. I wanted a reputation, wanted to be revered as some sort of anarchist. So I kept pushing boundaries, creating a large wedge between my parents and myself. The eve of my 16th birthday, I decided that I would refuse my bloodbath. I was lying on my bed, listening to music and reading when my mother came in to tell me they had gotten it ready for me. I knew it was coming, had my response ready. I'm not taking it, I said, refusing to look up from my book. Ben, please don't make this difficult. You know you need to, she said, wringing her hands fretfully. I continued to ignore her as she pleaded. After a while, my father came down to see what the delay was. What's going on, he asked, appearing in the doorway. My mother told him the situation, his face turning bright red. Ben, this is happening one way or another, he shouted. I threw my book across the room. Oh, you think so? I fired back, instantly bristling to the challenge. His eyes widened and his nostrils flared out. He was more angry than I'd ever seen him. That's right, his voice now becoming a growl. Without a second thought, I charged at him, knocking him aside and running down the stairs. I could hear him screaming at me all the way past the driveway, begging me to return. I ran for a long time, finally running out of breath and resting near a city bus stop. I sat down for a few minutes, aware of a strange sensation at the ends of my fingers. They felt tingly for a bit. Then they started to feel hot, terrified. I watched as they began to blister, running up past my knuckles and cracking open the skin on their way upward. Howling in agony and shocked by what I was seeing, I fell to the ground and writhed. There wasn't a soul around. My cries for help went unanswered as I kept on bubbling and cracking, making it all the way up to my elbows. Headlights appeared in front of my eyes, though I was nearly blind with pain. I recognized my father's car. He leapt out, grabbing me under my armpits and pulling me into the vehicle. I kept screaming during the drive showing him my disintegrating arms. We drove at a breakneck pace, my father cursing the whole time. His face white. He told me to hold on a little longer, that I would be okay soon. I expected him to take me to a hospital. When we pulled into our driveway, my entire arms and shoulders looked like raw hamburger meat, my skin blistering. My body went into shock. I vaguely recall being carried out of the vehicle, my mother running out to help. We went up the stairs, both of them grunting under my weight. Then blackness took over. Voices around me, swirling distortedly, started to come back into focus. Gradually, the sensation of pain seemed to lighten. My arms were no longer on fire. He was this close, this fucking close, my father was saying, sounding like he was going to break into sobs. My mother hushed him, telling him he had done a great job that he had saved me again. I could now feel that I was in a familiar substance, warm, inviting, soothing to my blistered skin. 
the bloodbath. When they noticed I was awake, they both broke down, telling me how worried they had been, how they could never live without me, that I was their entire world. Their hysterics got me going as well, realizing how awful I had been to them over the last year. They both held onto my hands as I let the blood saturate and heal my mangled skin. The next year, I had learned my lesson. My father prepped the tub for me, giving me a half smile as I thanked him after he told me it was ready. I never asked why I had to take them. I never asked where the blood came from. It just seemed like something that we all knew was better off left alone. Which brings me to this year. My father, who is now in his 60s, sat me down again. Ben, it's time you understand some things. He went on to explain that, late in my mother's pregnancy with me, she started having complications. She was on bed rest for a while, barely able to move. She delivered me two weeks before her due date, slightly underweight, but very sickly. He explained that he could do little for me, but watch as doctors and nurses did their best to keep me alive throughout the next months. I felt helpless. I begged to trade places with you and take the suffering you were going through from you, he told me, reaching forward and taking my hands. There was this man. I had seen him at the hospital often. He saw what we were going through, our family, and he offered me something, told me he knew a way to help keep you alive. I didn't want to hear it. I told him to leave me alone, but he persisted, claimed he was an angel of sorts. As you got, sicker and sicker, closer to death's door, he kept telling me he could help. I shook my head. This was a lot to take in, all new information to me. My father continued, tears spilling from his eyes as he went on. Then I was desperate. I loved you so much I couldn't lose you. I gave in, asked him to help. I begged, told him whatever he had to do, to do it. He smiled at me, told me he would save you. And just like that, you started to get better. I was shocked. The doctors, even more so, were healthy. It was a miracle. He wiped his eyes, leaned backward, trying to gather his thoughts, then looked at me. It was just before your first birthday when I saw the man again. It seemed like he had come out of thin air. He said the only way for you to stay alive was to give you your baths each year. I didn't believe him at first, but then we saw what was happening to you, to your skin. It was just like, what happened when you were turning 16? Only then it was much slower, he spoke shakily. So I, I did what I had to do. I spilled the blood. I filled the tub. And I have done it each year since. I'm sorry, son. I wish things had gone differently, he finished. I leaned forward and embraced him, having no words for the situation. We stayed like that for a while. Eventually, he broke it off, facing me again. Ben, there's something else. You know that I'm getting older. The time will come, maybe sooner than we think, that I won't be around anymore. He bit his lip, holding in his emotion. Ben, when that happens, you'll have to. Story three. I became infatuated with a blonde girl on TikTok named Chloe. So much so that I would watch her live streaming content on a daily basis for the past month. She did nothing more but hold her phone in her hand while laying in her bed and respond to mostly men's instant messages. I always thought it was kind of pathetic, but the girl was very attractive and was way out of my league. And she would actually respond to my messages when she was streaming live. Sometimes there would be 150 people watching her live streaming. Then other days, there would be only eight people viewing who were mostly guys. Tonight is a slow night for her, where she only had eight viewers. But then again, it's two, zero a.m., where most people are sleeping. As 2.15 a.m. approached, she hit an all-time low of having only four viewers, which I didn't mind, because then I would be the focal point of her attention. I always thought that she was alone in her room when she was streaming live. However, I just heard something deeply disturbing that wasn't meant to be heard by her viewers. I heard a male voice whisper do something, 
where Chloe's face looked really fearful after hearing the male voice. And she said, come on guys, come back. What can I do to make you guys not leave? What do you mean? I messaged her. Oh, I just want everyone to have fun and keep watching me. She typed back. She couldn't get her viewers up this early in the morning. So she said goodnight everyone. Then her live streaming was disconnected. I was a little bummed out that Chloe ended her live session. So I browsed TikTok to see if any other girls were streaming live. Then I came across another attractive blonde whose name is Libby. So I joined her live session. She too had a low viewer count because it was so late at night. I typed in, hi Libby, how are you doing tonight? I'm fine. I'm just hanging out. That's cool. How old are you? I'm 20 years old, Livy responded. Then I heard a faint male voice say, show more of your chest, where Livy's face went from relaxed to looking very uncomfortable fairly quick. The male voice seemed eerily similar to the voice on Chloe's live session. Livy pulled down on her dress without exposing her nipples, which drew in more people who were casually scrolling through TikTok and within a minute, her viewer count went up significantly to the point where she couldn't answer everyone's questions. Livy looked uncomfortable, exposing most of her chest. As I started to look at Livy's bedroom, where she was filming her live session from, I noticed that when she pointed her phone's camera to the ceiling that it was the same ceiling fan, an unusual octantal ceiling shape as Chloe's room. I thought to myself that what are the chances that someone has the same exact ceiling fan and the same highly unusual ceiling layout. So I continued to watch Libby's live session to pick up on other characteristics of her room. Then I said, what the hell? Out loud when I saw that Libby had the same dresser and her closet was in the same place as Chloe's. This is the same room as Chloe's, I said out loud. Being that I'm 30, one years old and older than most of the other male viewers on TikTok, I'm probably the only person who cares enough to pick up on the room's similarities to the point where it's undeniably the same bedroom. I always thought these young women were just doing these live sessions for fun, while hoping to make some extra money. However, this is the first time that I thought something really sinister was going on. I thought to myself, why would Chloe leave her bedroom so another young woman could pretend that it's her bedroom to start another live streaming session? There was no other logical explanation other than these girls were working in shifts and were more than likely being forced to do these live sessions. Something else that irked me was when a male viewer would jokingly type into Chloe's live session, I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you. Where Chloe would respond to those offensive comments with send me a private message, which I previously had thought was just a joke. But now I'm assuming that these girls are unwillingly prostituting themselves out. So I typed in, I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you. Like clockwork. She responded back, send me a private message. So I sent the private message and Libby responded, where do you live? I live in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'll be in Maryland in two weeks from now. Libby messaged me back. That's not horribly far from Pennsylvania. Can I see you if I drive to Maryland? I responded. Sure, if the price is right, lol. Libby responded. How about $200? Um, I think I'll be too busy when I visit Maryland to see you. How about $500? I think I could find the time to see you, lol. Okay. How do I send you the money then? Send the $500 to this PayPal account that I'll copy and paste in a second. And then I'll send you the address in time when you can see me. Once again, I thought this conduct was really unusual. And I doubted that the person who I sent the private message to was actually Libby, but was more than likely that guy who I heard in the background. I thought to myself, $500 is a good amount of money but is also a figure that most young men could come up with. The most obvious thing to do was wait until Chloe came on her live session tomorrow and ask her the same question of, can I come see you? I woke up the next day and went to work. Then I came home and waited for Chloe to come on. I logged on to TikTok with one of my dummy accounts and eventually she logged on to her live session. I waited a few minutes, then I typed in, I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you. 
where Chloe typed in the same phrase as Libby did send me a private message. I went through the same back and forth messaging where I almost couldn't believe it when Chloe messaged me that she will be in Maryland in two weeks and I had to pay her $500 to get an address and a time. I now had the disgusting feeling that these young women were somehow being trafficked. So I paid the $500 to both Chloe's and Libby's PayPal accounts. And unsurprisingly, I was given the same Comfort Inn hotel address in Glen Burnie, Maryland, but with different hotel rooms and different times. I now was on a mission to uncover how many young women were being exploited on TikTok. So I continually sent the I'll pay you if I can come over to hang out with you message on different TikTok dummy accounts that I had created. Amazingly, five other girls said that they were going to be in Maryland in two weeks. I didn't feel it was necessary to spend the $500 to get the actual address and time. So I waited the two weeks. Then I drove to Maryland and waited in the hotel parking lot where I could see both of the hotel rooms that Chloe and Libby had given me. I was about five hours early from seeing Libby, which was the first room and time that I was given to see. As I waited in the parking lot, I saw something extremely appalling, where a bunch of younger guys would drive into the parking lot and get out of their cars and then knock on predetermined hotel doors, about once an hour to include Chloe's and Libby's hotel room, where the hotel door would open and the young guys would go in. Seeing car after car pull into the hotel parking lot, then seeing some guy get out of his car and head to a predetermined hotel room kind of reminded me of the same visuals of watching countless people get out of their cars to go into a blockbuster back in the day or watching guys get out of their cars to go into a strip club because of the sheer endless volume of guys that would continually enter and exit the parking lot. I figured there must be at least 30 different hotel rooms and this hotel was purposely selected because of its large parking lot and the ability for someone to watch from the parking lot at the various rooms that were being utilized by the TikTok girls. I noticed that there were three cars in the parking lot where each car had a guy that was constantly watching the traffic coming in and out of the hotel rooms. These guys definitely looked like shady characters and weren't cops. Eventually, my time came to go to Libby's hotel room, so I got out of my car where I felt a sense of nervous enthusiasm to see what was actually going on. I knocked on Libby's door and she answered the door. Right away, I could tell that was really high on some type of substance, which might have been from crack or ecstasy. Libby definitely didn't have the same personality that she displayed on TikTok. She actually handed me a condom within five minutes where I almost threw up from the vileness that was occurring. Libby was so out of it that I couldn't even hold a conversation with her and I could tell that she was brainwashed not to ask for help or anything along those lines. I saw enough of what I needed to see and I gave the condom back to her. Then I went back to my car. I felt a complete sense of disgust and sleaziness come over me, where I couldn't even get out of my car two hours later to see Chloe during my assigned time. I decided to just hang out in the parking overnight and see what would happen in the morning. The next morning at about eight, 0 a.m. A large commercial Mart's passenger bus pulled into the driveway, which woke me up from my dead sleep. At about 8.15 a.m., each TikTok girl was being pushed out of her hotel room by some unknown guy who went from room to room. At about 9, 0 a.m., I saw about 50 girls get onto the bus, which nearly made me throw up. Then the bus pulled away, and I decided to follow the bus. The bus eventually got onto interstate. I, 80 West, and it just kept driving and driving where I almost fell asleep behind the wheel. I tried to stay far away back from the bus so the drive wouldn't know that I was following it. And I had to get gas at the same time, which I used the same caution and fueled up away from the bus. After almost 20 hours of painstaking driving, the bus got off. I, 80 and stopped in this hole in the wall town in Wyoming called Rock Springs. The bus drove outside of the town and into this large compound that reminded me of the David Koresh compound that the authorities tried to overtake in Waco, Texas. I didn't pull into the compound for fear of my own life. So I just took down the coordinates and then went back to the town of Rock Springs where I pulled into a gas station. 
Because of the magnitude that was going on in that compound, I decided that I couldn't trust the local authorities, and instead I contacted the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Agent Sipkowitz took down the information that I had provided, and she seemed equally as shocked as I was regarding the magnitude of the operation. Agent Sipkowitz told me that she would contact me if any additional information was needed from me. The next day, Chloe and Libby didn't log on to their TikTok Live accounts, so I typed Rock Springs into Google's recent news stories, and I saw a story about an overnight raid that had occurred, where I saw the photo of the compound in Rock Springs, and the title read, A Potential Human Trafficking. Operation was uncovered, 